Okay, <clears throat> we're gonna move to the uh, next uh, session, which is gonna be on trauma. I'm Max Boachi from the University of Louisville, and I'll be moderating with uh, Jesse Bible from Penn State. Now we're gonna have uh, Dr. Steve Ludwig from University of Maryland talk about treatment of bilateral facet dislocations and going anteriorly or posteriorly. Thank you, Jesse, Max, for allowing me to participate. Uh, and the ICL. So, so what I want to do over the next few minutes is sort of give everybody sort of this 50,000 foot overview of some of the pearls that we've learned over the past several years at University of Maryland Shock Trauma in patients that, that suffer from a, a bilateral facet dis dislocation. These are my disclosures, none of which are, are pertinent to, to this talk. So some of the, the big ideas, right? Bilateral, we're not talking about unilateral or flexion distraction injuries. We're talking about bilateral facet dislocations, right? They are a significant osseodisco ligamentous injury. And <clears throat> because of that, there is a significant number that are associated with traumatic disc herniations. So just so we're all on the same page, we're talking about 50% of translation of the vertebral bodies. The IAPs are dislocated bilaterally over the SAPs, with or without a traumatic disc herniation, with or without a spinal cord injury, with or without lamina fractures, vertebral body burst fractures, spinous processes fractures. They represent about 5 to 10% of the overall injuries, most commonly at the C5-6 level. Most in men, because we're idiots and we do stupid things, and um, in a varied age group, right, either younger or much older people from high mechanism of injuries. At shock trauma, we see a lot of high-speed mo high motor vehicle collisions, as well as diving injuries as well from our, our Chesapeake um, Shore uh, injuries. 85 to 90 percent of these injuries have some associated neurologic injury. Up to 80 percent, depending upon which series you look at, will have a complete spinal cord injury. Now, our goals of treatment are important to understand, right? We want to prevent deterioration, enhance their recovery. We want to realign, stabilize, and we want to prevent against delayed pain, deformity, and further neurologic involvement. So one of the decision-making uh, sort of criteria that we're faced with is when do you go to the operating room, right? Are you dealing with an isolated trauma or are you dealing with somebody with a high ISS score uh, that, like this patient here, is polytraumatized. So our algorithm at our trauma center is that <clears throat> ATLS guidelines are, are sort of established, the patients are resuscitated, and all their li acute life-threatening injuries are managed in the face of polytrauma. And then our trauma surgeons say, tag your it, you know, go ahead and treat their cervical spine fractures. And <clears throat> the criteria that they use when we vet it past them, when we can go to the operating room medically. Our preference is to do it sooner rather than later, much based upon Michael's uh, stasis work uh, that we were contributors to as well, is in the face of hemodynamic instability, you're not going to the OR, everybody knows that. Coagulopathy, hypothermia, you're not going to the operating room. Resuscitatively, we use serum lactate levels. So if there's one thing to sort of take home about this is that if if you have a normal serum lactate level, which is about two or below, or a normalizing serum lactate level, our trauma docs typically will allow us to go to the operating room. And Michael in his talk brought up a lot of these sort of salient points, right? Some of the big take home messages that we think about is that sooner is better than later, right? With regards to neurologic outcome. You heard about the, the, the sort of the, the, the thoughts about steroid use and at shock trauma, we use it as an option in isolated cervical spinal cord injuries in otherwise young, healthy patients. And I think my, Michael alluded to that in his talk, in addition to maintaining your MAP at 85 to 90 for about seven days, right? Those have been shown to be helpful. Second thing to think about, and this has come up at multiple CSRS meetings, ICLs, et cetera, is the role for MRI scan, immediate reduction of a bilateral facet dislocation. So let's talk briefly about that. And pragmatically, the, the best way to get somebody decompressed is by realigning them if, if they fulfill specific criteria, right? 
and awake, alert, cooperative, right? That, those are important criteria that you need to take home to initiate a realignment even prior to getting an MRI scan. And when you look at a lot of the data, there's never been a permanent, permanent, I want to be very clear about this, never been a permanent neurologic deficit in an awake, alert, cooperative uh, patient. There's been neurologic deteriorations, but never a permanent deficit because of the, of the failure to really establish the correlation between a traumatic disc herniation and an awake, alert, cooperative patient um, and neurologic decline. So the current evidence um, is that it supports closed reduction in an awake, alert, cooperative patient uh, prior to getting an MRI. However, before you go to the operating room, getting an MRI scan can dictate your surgical approach, as we'll talk about briefly. Now, the safety of the closed reduction, once again, um, has been shown to be effective at neurologic improvement and, and achieving your, your goal of realignment. And, and if I poll the room, for those of you that have dealt with bilateral facet, unilateral facet dislocations, I preferentially would rather bring a reduced realigned spine to the operating room than do an operative, intraoperative um, reduction. I don't know if anybody else shares that, but that's, that's sort of our preference. The closed reduction techniques, is anybody doing it now? Show of hands of people that are actually closed reducing. Right, it's, it's almost becoming a lost art. Our fellow, some of our fellows are here, and I'm not quite sure how many, how many of them uh, have actually reduced a cervical spine dislocation, but it's almost becoming a lost art. But you really need a team, um, a team approach to getting these patients aligned. You have to make sure you're not dealing with an occipital cervical dissociation, you're not dealing with skull fractures, because sometimes you have to pull with a significant amount of weight, especially in unilateral facet dislocations. You also need to make sure that patients are being monitored, not only neurologically, but because you're consciously sedating them in the face of trauma, you have to watch out, watch out for their cardiopulmonary status, have to make sure that an MRI in the OR is accessible if you can't get them reduced. Some of the basic tenants, right, we actually still have striker frames. Um, these are not, these are becoming few and far between. Unilaterals are much harder than bilaterals. The higher the level are easier. Um, once again, awake, alert, cooperative is the key. And this is an example of somebody with a bilateral facet dislocation. You could see with 20, 30, 40, 50, you could see us getting this reduced fairly expediently and safely. When do you stop, right? You should stop if they're worsening, right? You should stop if you're not making any progress. You should stop if you're you know, di di divulging in other occipital cervical injuries. You should absolutely not continue on if you can't see the cervical thoracic dislocation, right? So, 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 so those are absolute stops, right? What about <clears throat> going to the operating room, right? You have to have the patient medically stable, right? So make sure they're stable, clear by the trauma team. Um, you couldn't successfully reduce them, and you have all your imaging, um, your, all your imaging uh, available to you to make that clinical decision. So let's lastly talk about operative management, right? What are, what, how do we, we treat this? And it's very rare that we're doing anterior-based anterior -based alone procedures for a bilateral facet dislocation because of the mechanics. I'll share with you some of the data with that. But we base our decision making based upon the neurologic status of the patient, the presence of the disc herniation or vertebral body fractures, the level, bone quality, and other host-related fractures. So posterior uh, approach is for patients without a disc herniation. It's mechanically superior. We do it under neuromonitoring. It's a simple, straightforward technique if you can't close, reduce them to get them manipulated back and get them reduced. And we all know the pros, and this was debated in the first, in the HECT uh, anterior, posterior um, sort of discussion. The same pros and cons of anterior versus posterior are true. They're more worrisome in the face of trauma because some of the pulmonary um, issues that can occur when you prone position them. And we know it's safe, we know it's effective. So in this 28 neurologically intact, polytraumatized female, we, we can't get a neurologic exam. That patient has an, a, a, a non-significant disc herniation, uh, gets a posterior reduction instrumentation and fusion. Additionally, this C45 bilateral facet dislocation 
C5 Asia B, no traumatic disc herniation, uh, gets done from the back to realign, stabilize because of her underlying osteoporosis. What about anterior-based uh, anterior -based procedures? Be very, very careful if you're doing this in a standalone. We typically will go anterior in the presence of anterior ventral compression to the cord as a result of the injury. I absolutely hate, hate doing anterior-based reduction. I don't know if anybody will raise their hand and say, I love this. This is one thing that gives me a little bit of angst in the operating room. It's challenging, it's difficult, and, and <clears throat> essentially it can be very, very, um, very challenging to assess your reduction, especially at the cervical thoracic junction. John Sledge, a while back, sort of had this great technique where you do, if you can't get a reduced a buttress plate and you reduce some uh, from the back in the face of an irreducible dislocation, something to keep in mind. Uh, but once again, be careful of over-distracting these patients because of the disco ligamentous injury. Be careful of osteoporosis. Um, <clears throat> all of those may play a role with, with failure. I think the other issue with anterior-based approaches are be careful in the face of facet fractures, high-speed mechanisms of injury, and once again, the osteoporotic patient. So in this 35-year-old industrial accident, C5 Asia C, C4-5 uh, bilateral facet dislocation with a traumatic disc herniation, this patient, no facet fractures, can get an anterior cervical discectomy fuse. This is one of the cases few and far between. What about doing it 360, right? In somebody like this, 38-year-old, you can't trust them, intoxicated, polytraumatized, uncooperative, C4 Asia C. Uh, once again, this is somebody with bilateral perched, not necessarily dislocated, but perched uh, facet joints at C3-4. Um, you could see uh, fracturing of the posterior elements as well, and what I interpreted at the time uh, with a traumatic disc herniation with cord injury gets an anterior posterior procedure. So in summary, facet dislocations are significant significant discoligamentous injuries with or without associated neurologic deficits. It's not uncommon uh, to have associated injuries. Think about how we deal with polytraumatized versus non-traumatized, uh, you know, sort of non-polytraumatized patients. You have to be awake, alert, cooperative uh, if you're gonna undergo immediate reduction. I think it's debatable whether or not you need to get that pre-reduction MRI scan um, you definitely need to do it before you go to the operating room. I think the host factors are important to, do, to understanding whether or not your approach should be anterior, posterior, or 360. Most of the time we're going posterior or 360, but once again, be very, very careful of anterior-related approaches. Thank you so much. So we've got a few minutes for questions. I'll start off with one for... Steve, so you talk about, Steve, you talk about what's your technique in your institution for close reduction? If, you, if you're saying it's a lost art, are you doing any OR? Are you, are you is the patient awake for all these, or are you trusting your neural monitoring? Yeah, great question. I mean, I mean it really depends, Jesse. Uh, I, I think it depends on a lot of factors. One is resource allocation and availability. That plays a role, you know, whether or not the patient is cleared to go to the operating room. But... Once again, I, and I sort of prefaced this during the talk, that I would much rather have that patient that is awake, alert, and cooperative reduced, get an MRI scan, and then go to the operating room. That is my preference overall. If, if I'm unable to do that, if the patient has no exam, we'll go to the you know, MRI scanner, figure out what to do, which approach, and then we'll do it under neuromonitoring. And that's typically an anterior posterior approach in, in our experiences. If somebody is totally unstable, totally unstable, they're uptunded, they're polytraumatized, and they're dislocated, then that's a rare case where we'll get neuromonitoring involved, bring them up to the unit, and we'll do a closed reduction under neuromonitoring. 